until we get some questions, um, and by all means, just uh, I will stop as they come in, but um, until we get some questions, I'm gonna start with just kind of our, our basics from here. So, um, before, I guess one other thing before I get started into this, something that I feel like isn't as strong as it used to be, uh, and that is establishing a relationship with a auto mechanic or shop. Um, without doing that these days, um, it doesn't keep that constant rapport with somebody that you build trust with. Um, and I, I stress that to all of my students that come through this, I would stress that to anyone that is listening to this. And that is, I'm not saying the first shop you go to should or can be your only one. It can go many different ways. That being said, um, once you can establish that relationship and move from there, it will help you know um, or, or be able to trust that mechanic, okay? Unfortunately, in our industry, much like other industries, it's very easy and common for us to be able to, um, should I say, rip people off, you know, to be dishonest. Um, and that's a name that we're trying to fix. That's part of why we highly believe in this auto program here at Southern, basing it off of integrity and uh, using God's principles when we're doing that. Uh, but again, basing the, ga gaining that, um, that trust with a shop. I a lot of times like to say it's very similar to when you are looking for a doctor. You go out and when you're establishing your primary care provider, um, you're looking for somebody that you trust their judgment, trust their feedback. And that's something that I wish I could tell you every shop does, but it is something that is helpful if you look for um, and use them for everything they're willing to do, if that makes sense. Um, what people, what a lot of people think is, oh, well, I'm going to go to uh, Valvoline to get my oil changed or Walmart. And again, nothing uh, against these quick change places, but you can actually take it to your mechanic if they have that service or if they have the time to do it. And then they're going to be keeping eye, an eye on certain maintenance items and keeping you up to date with things that may need to be done in the future. So... Um, okay, we're going to shift now, go ahead and, and jump into just basic checks. And again, this, this is going to start very basic, but go over some things that maybe not everyone has the, the knowledge on. So first thing we're going to do is go ahead and check the oil. Anytime you're checking the oil, first thing, pull the dipstick out and wipe it off. Now, if you're not familiar with this, a lot of your newer cars are actually going away from a dipstick, especially the higher end cars. Some of the higher end cars, there is not a dipstick. They're gonna do it all through your information display in the center of the car. Um, and so in that information display, you are going to be, um, you're gonna to have to go through and find the spot. Now, most common ones that are doing that is, again, higher end, BMW, Mercedes, uh, but you're gonna start seeing that, I believe, come through even more. So pull out the dipstick, wipe it off, back in, and um, we're just gonna kind of hopefully help you see that on the camera. So when I'm looking at this, I'm looking for the difference between this dot and this dot. Linsky, can we see that okay? All right. So with looking between these two, this would be your maximum level, this is your minimum. Um, just by the look of it, now I have not started the car in a while. We pulled it in on the, the lift about 15, 20 minutes ago. So I may want to go ahead and run that um, just to be sure but what I was seeing and I'm going to again go back through one more time what I'm seeing is it looks like we're actually a little bit high on our oil level so we're up here uh, is what I'm seeing and we should be down there so we're close to a quart quart and a half over on our oil level not a huge deal necessarily but there are some uh, complications that can happen but again, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run the car here in a minute and just verify that we are that high. Um, now, when we are talking about the difference between the two dots, these two dots, we actually are from our minimum level to our maximum. Anything in between is what we call the safe zone. Safe zone, um, don't have to do anything. We actually find several of the manufacturers out there um, have it to where their full level is actually right in the middle of safe zone, not at the max. Um, and uh, if you were to pull your dipstick and let's say your oil level was down here um, at that minimum level, 
so down there at that minimum level, it takes one U.S. court, based out of the U.S. here, uh, one U.S. court to get from the minimum to the maximum on pretty much any uh, car that you're talking about. Now, when we're talking oil, a couple of different things that we can do is we can look into, um, I'm going to just pull the oil cap off here for you, but um, a lot of times it'll have the oil weight on the, the oil cap for you. Um, but with that oil weight, um, there's a lot of things that float around. There's a lot of questions that come with that. So kind of wanted to go over your different types of oil, your different weights, and what we're looking for in that. Now, I should preface this with uh, how we do a lot of videos, and that is some of this is my own opinion, and I will 100% put it out there and preface it. Um, but this car, as you can see on this, uh, calls for... 0W20. Um, 0W20 is a type of oil and with that, um, with that 0W20 um, we have going up from there 5W20, 5W30, so on and so forth. Um, with that, th that's what we call the weight of the oil. Now in today's day and age this 0W20 to my knowledge nobody has come out with a non-synthetic. Okay. Um, 020 only comes in a full synthetic, but you can do, uh, so with that one, you are full synthetic only. What are our different tiers? Well, we have full synthetic, we have synthetic blend, and then what people call conventional. Um, I'm no oil expert, uh, but what I can tell you is typically on our full synthetic, mechanics will recommend we go about 5,000 miles, and then on our synthetic blend or conventional, we go somewhere around 3,000. Now, a lot of your newer cars aren't sticking with that. Uh, they're actually telling you that, oh, you should go 7,500 miles in between oil changes, possibly 10,000 miles between oil changes. Now, while that may be okay and the car will run on that, um, I have a little bit of an issue with it. And uh, that is you cannot change the oil too often. Okay. Is it a waste of money? Sure, if you're going way too often. But oil is your lifeblood of your engine. That is what does keeps you running, keeps things lubricated, keeps things cool. And with all of that happening, that's actually what's going to give you um, that engine lasting for a very long time. The more often we change it, the less buildup we have. So again, using medical terminologies are kind of bouncing between that. A lot of us talk about or know or understand uh, when we talk about clogged arteries and things like that. Um, the same thing happens with oil. Oil actually builds a, has a buildup that can happen uh, over time. And that buildup can actually cause our oil galleys to shrink uh, to the point where they are no longer feeding oil properly to certain areas. So um, when we're talking about oil, you know, when we're talking about oil changes, again, I, personal opinion, I stick with going every three to 5,000 miles, depending on the type of oil. Now, do I worry about it to the mile, the, the 10 miles or the 100 miles between, you know, or, or around that? No, um, but something like, hey, I'm, I'm about to go on a trip, say a, a 500 mile road trip. You know, if you're within, a thousand miles of needing an oil change, I'd go ahead and take that trip. Make sure that we are full on our level, take that trip, come back, and then we're planning to do an oil change. And that's kind of what I base it off of. If you're sticking around town, just kind of keeping an eye on it and then scheduling your next oil change as soon as you can with that. Now between your different weights of oil, 520, 530, 1030, and we kind of have a bunch that go up from there. It's always best to stick with the manufacturer recommended as your car calls for. Um, there are cars out there that will call for different weights depending on temperatures outside. The weights truly mean how viscous they are or how good they flow. Um, and then they flow better in cold temperatures versus hot and uh, that protection you're going to get. So typically, again, stick with what the car has. Now, when I teach this in a class, I typically will go through and tell them, let's go through a scenario. There's still parts of the US where you can be driving around and you may go a few hundred miles before you hit your next gas station. So let's just say we're in a, a town, doesn't have much, has a little gas station, 
and man, somehow we're low on oil. We checked it. We're a little nervous about it. Well, they don't have 020 on the shelf. They have one rack and all it has is 5W30. My personal opinion on that, and I think most mechanics would agree with me, any oil, engine oil, any engine oil is better than no oil. So if that's all you have to add to it, to move on, then we start with that, we add it in, and then we get it changed as soon as possible uh, to move us into going back to what was purely in there, okay? So um, that's kind of your different weights of oil and different things that we're needing to do there. Um, now, as far as other fluids that we're dealing with under the hood, uh, I'm just gonna kind of rattle them off. We'll switch our camera to looking under the hood and uh, kind of rattle those off to you. But we've got coolant. So coolant will be over here in this corner. Not sure if, can we see it okay, Lansky? All right, so we got coolant over here. Um, thing with coolant, a lot of your newer cars, they will have a clear um, container like this. That clear container has a maximum and a minimum level. Um, so it's all good and easy to see. If it has to where it has a radiator cap and just a side one, we may need to check it a couple of different ways. Now, with that, there's a lot of different coolants out on the market. Every manufacturer has said, oh, we must have a certain type of coolant. Um, they've all changed their coloring uh, to be specific to them. You can also go to parts stores and they will have a just generic or uh, what they call an all makes all models. Um, this is where not my area of expertise, but for years I have used all makes and all models types of coolant in many customers' cars, um, and I have not seen any negative effects by it, okay? Still wanting to check it pretty often, um, but go from there. Um, so, do we got a question coming up? It looks like we got some, something, so I'm gonna stop and see if we've got a question here real quick. Okay. They ask, can I use water as a coolant? Okay. That's a great question, actually. Um, so when we're talking about using water as coolant, um, this is very common in tropical places. Florida, I know, I realize that's not crazy tropical, um, but Hawaii, we've seen it happen a lot. Uh, but using water has major negative effects on it, okay? If we use straight water, so a coolant, let's back up, let's go back to our coolant. Coolant is actually a mixture 50-50. It's 50% coolant, 50% distilled water. One of the main reasons we like to use distilled water there is it has no added minerals, uh, and so it, we won't have any reactions with the metals and different types of materials we're gonna be using within the engine. If we use straight water, um, first of all, it, rusts, it corrodes, so any metal that it's going to get in contact with, it will start breaking it down, whereas coolant has an anti-corrosive, anti-rust uh, property. Um, then also coolant has a lubricating capacity to it, and that lubricating is for a water pump. That water pump is strictly just a, we call it a water pump, so it does throw customers off or um, individuals when they're thinking of the cooling system. But with a water pump or coolant pump, if you want to call it that, that's actually going to take that coolant and send it through the engine. That is a pump spinning at a fairly high rate of speed. There are bearings within that that need to be lubricated. Okay? They used to lubricate it off of grease and oil in different ways, but typically these days, all of them are lubricated by the coolant. So if I run straight water, water does not have much of a lubricating um, aspect to it. Okay? And I could, I guess, get a sample of it, and you may not be able to tell, but if you ever get a chance, take a little bit of coolant and rub it between your fingers, and then take a little bit of water, take it between your other two fingers, you're gonna feel a much better or much smoother feel where the coolant is. That's gonna give us that lubrication for what we need. And with having that lubrication, uh, longevity of the water pump, longevity of the engine, not getting that rust or corrosion, um, and then moving on from there. So the problem is it used to be very common for us to say, hey, with coolant, we need to change it every two years. 
and that was just something we did. We changed coolant every two years, and it was kind of on a normal schedule. Well, we've come out with long life coolants. They're going five years, 10 years, and there's not really a, a industry standard anymore. Using your owner's manual, using what uh, is um, designed by the manufacturer would be best in what you're doing. But again, it's similar to oil. We can't necessarily change it too often, okay? So it's not like something where, oh, no, don't change it. We don't need to, um, but it, it isn't something you just need to run to your mechanic tomorrow and say, hey, I need a coolant change because uh, I, I saw somebody on YouTube say so, okay? Um, going back to the coolant properties, hopefully that answered your question on water. Uh, well, let's actually stop real quick. So one thing I like to, to hit when I'm teaching a class on automotive maintenance, and that is we want our young people to go out and serve the world, okay? Uh, student missionaries. And, and be out um, sharing God's word. Now with that, one thing that can happen is you can be out uh, on a mission trip or a long-term mission trip and somehow be stuck. I use the, uh, okay, we're driving in the jungle. We, we start to have a vehicle overheat. We'll get into that here in just a minute, but have a vehicle start to overheat. We notice we are low on coolant. If you have water jugs with you, or if you have, um, a stream that you can pull water out of. Any, I shouldn't say any liquid, uh, any water that's semi-clean that you can put into the system would be better than overheating. What is overheating? Well, that's when we have not enough coolant circulating through the engine to actually remove the heat. Coolant's main job, we call it coolant, we call it antifreeze. One of its main jobs uh, during the summer or any of the hot months, it's even during the winter when the engine is running, is to keep all those internal engine parts cool. Now, it has a adverse uh, or another property to it. We can keep it from freezing. Water will freeze. So another thing that happens is people from Florida will, will be in the mindset of, I can just use straight water. Um, and then they'll come up north, even further north, and water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. When it starts to freeze, water is ice, we should say. Once it freezes, turns to ice. Ice is stronger than, than even the metal that's surrounding it. So what we see is we've had them completely destroy an engine because that expansion that happens when ice builds, it actually pushes out on the engine and actually cracks the engine either internally or externally. Um, and ruins, it's, it's actually a replacement of an engine at that point. So when we use straight water, there's another problem that we can do with that, or with that we can have with that. Okay, um, but, <coughs> excuse me, straight in the mic. So um, <coughs> with the, the water, uh, again, just not a common thing, but if you are in a point where all you're trying to do is get from point A to point B, I mean, you're at a grocery store, you need to get it to the mechanic. It's not just completely dumping out on the ground, meaning you're pouring it in, it's pouring out just as fast. You could put water in it, get it to your mechanic, um, and then go from there. Now, it kind of takes me off topic for just a second, but something that I want to, to point out when we're talking about that, whether oil, whether water, if you're close enough to your mechanic that a tow bill is reasonable, um, remember a hundred dollar tow bill plus you may have that hundred or more dollar um, diagnosis fee is still cheaper than replacement of an engine or major parts so um, with that you just want to be thinking through some of these uh, what seems like basic thoughts uh, but we have seen um, I've had customers pull in with smoke pouring out the hood and by that point, they have actually done so much damage to the engine, we're looking at either a major overhaul or replacement. So um, using straight water can be done in case of emergency, but needs to be taken out and flushed out as soon as possible, filled up with the correct type of coolant or at least something that fits the manufacturer and we go from there. It is never wrong to use the manufacturer specific coolant, uh, but just putting it out there, what I've seen is that's typically one and a half to two times the price of that all makes all models coolant that you can get at some of your local parts stores and or Walmarts and places like that. 
So coolant was our other one. Um, switch back over here, looking under the hood. Back here, typically straight off of the driver, we'll have our um, brake fluid. Um, with the brake fluid, there's several different types that can happen there. Uh, and when I say different types, we have dot three, four, and five are your most common. Dot three and four are your most common in a um, manufacturer specific setting. So when we are talking about dot three and dot four, uh, it's a boiling point difference. Use what's, man what's asked for by the manufacturer, you should be just fine. How often should brake fluid be changed? Probably about every two years. Uh, and that's the most neglected fluid usually under the hood of a vehicle. Okay, power steering fluid. Now, not all vehicles these days actually use power steering fluid. This one is labeled on the cap. Um, again, has a clear reservoir here. Harder to see because it's not as clear as it should be, but we've got a maximum and a minimum level on it. Um, a lot of times I found a, a flashlight will help me see down in there. And on this one, I actually see that I'm closer down to the minimum. Um, so we are needing to top that off, but we are above the minimum. So we are within safe zone. Okay. On the newer cars that don't have a power steering, do not fluid. Don't freak out by it. A lot of them are going electronic these days. Um, and then washer fluid, just your basic. Uh, that is something you can pick up at, you know, Walmart or any of your local supply places. What will usually happen, though, is when we are um, dealing with a mechanic shop that's doing your oil changes, and a, a lot of your quick lube places will do this as well, they will check all of your fluids, including your washer fluid, and typically top it off. Um, not saying all mechanic shops do that, but it is something you could, could look into. Um, Simple with when we get into our power steering fluid, or sorry, into our washer fluid. Uh, again, make sure there is actually, at least around here, there's a summer mixture and a winter mixture. One just has a lower uh, freezing point, uh, and so you would want to make sure that you're paying attention to that as the year progresses. So just uh, something to think through there. Um, bouncing back, sorry to bounce back and forth on you, bouncing back to power steering fluid. That is a manufacturer specific type thing most of the time. There are some fluids that fit multiple, multiple manufacturers, uh, but something you'll want to either check with your dealer or your mechanic um, and then go from there. Out of all of these fluids I just mentioned, none of them besides the washer fluid just go away because they feel like it. Uh, best way I can put it. Uh, typically, of course, washer fluid gets used when we use it. The rest of them are just a fluid that should be circulating through um, its system. So when we have uh, a time where our uh, fluids are low, that is a good time to, to, unless you know what's going on, that's a good time to schedule with a mechanic and have them check. Say, hey, notice this fluid was low. Could, could you just take a look and, and give me your advice? Um, and then they can kind of help you from there. So. All right, uh, from here, um, I think I've covered all of the basic fluids under the hood. If you have any other questions, feel free to ask them as we go. Um, I was gonna jump down to looking from the side of the car. So give me one second. We're gonna get the car lifted. It's gonna take us just a second here. I'm gonna have, I've got one of our student techs here helping me out. So he's gonna go ahead and lift it up. I'll keep talking. Um, as we go through this, I would also like to hit on a few things of why or what we do when we're purchasing a car. Um, so when we are purchasing a car, um, there's a lot of things we could do. If you are purchasing a car for the first time, used, especially new, this is, doesn't apply to new, but when you're first time purchasing a used car or any time, it's not a bad idea to get it scheduled with your mechanic, okay? And scheduling that with your mechanic I'm gonna go ahead and move this with me. Um, but when scheduling with your mechanic there, um, Skylar, that's probably good for now. Um, but when we're, when we're scheduling with a mechanic, you are asking them, hey, I'm buying this car. They're gonna look for all your problem areas. Something that I've found in the past is if you are dealing with someone who doesn't want their car checked, so we've done it a couple ways. Say you're buying it off of Facebook or you saw it on the side of the road. Um, we've had customers in the past come in and say, hey, I'm looking at this vehicle. Could I get an appointment to, to have it looked at? 
work it out with the owner. Sometimes the owner will be willing to take it as long as you are paying for the service. Um, you know, especially when they have nothing to hide. And, and again, I know that is a personal preference there, but uh, we found that that's typically what's happening when we're dealing with that. So um, by all means, make sure you're getting it checked out because that will help you a lot of heartache in the end. I've had several customers in the past go ahead and purchase cars without getting them checked out, uh, and that has uh, been a negative effect on them. So. Wanted to jump to wheels and tires here. Uh, we ran into one small complication when we pulled this car in, and that is that we can't find it. Now, um, not trying to beat up on it, but there is a, this has aftermarket wheels on it that aren't factory for this car. And with that, they had to use an aftermarket lug nut, which I will grab a camera and zoom in for you here in just a minute. But they've used aftermarket lug nuts. Those aftermarket lug nuts don't fit your normal tools out of a shop you have a specific tool that fits it. Um, when we talk about a specific tool that fits it, um, yeah, we'll go ahead and jump over and, and actually bring you in here. So when we talk about a specific tool that fits it, um, let me see if we can get this adjusted. I think this is gonna give us probably about the shot we want. Um, get you a little light in here. So when we talk about a specific tool that fits it, if you notice that lug nut, now I know some of you have never looked at one, we'll grab you one here in a minute. Actually, Skylar, can you go grab me a, just a basic lug nut? You know where the bucket of them is, right? Okay. So when you look at a lug nut, um, we'll show you that. It's your common sizing. Um, this is splined, and that spline takes a special tool. That special tool um, was not given to this customer when they purchased this car. This car was purchased, I think, just a couple of weeks ago for this particular customer, um, and it was not given to them. So with it not being given to them, um, we actually have no way of taking it off. And with having no way to take it off, we also have no way for if they were to get a flat on the side of the road, we have no way to do it. Thank you. So as Skylar just got for me, um, yeah, tell me which one we're going to. All right. Okay. So as Skylar just got for me, uh, we've got three different styles of lug nuts here. So with this, uh, just by looking at it, it, looks like about a 19 millimeter socket fits on there. Uh, most of your lug nuts these days are gonna be in a metric sizing. So 19 millimeter, uh, and then that's, we're talking about the, the actual tool that fits it. Uh, probably about the same size there. There's another style of lug nut, but again, takes a basic tool. It's not gonna have that spline, or you can even have a bolt style. A bolt style, European style we call it. Most of your European cars use this. So instead of having a nut, or sorry, a stud with the nut that screws onto it, we have a bolt that fits in. Either way, we're still looking at a basic. Now there are a lot of cars out there that will come with um, different locks, different keys, such as this one. The problem is when a car is purchased, uh, or used, there are times where that key doesn't actually come with them. So something we're dealing with here, we were gonna try to take the tires off and, and look at a few things, but Cool thing is we actually have quite a bit of space in this, so we're gonna still give you uh, some rundown on brakes and brake pads and things like that. So first thing we're gonna actually hit on. Um, so this customer, again, told me they just purchased this car within the last couple of weeks. And with that, um, they said, hey, I, I know that I'm gonna need tires. So we're gonna start focusing on tires and look at that first. So I'm trying to turn the wheel here for just a second. I'm gonna bring a camera around. Give me one second to grab a tool. All right, so um, when we're looking at the tires, bring you around here. So if we can switch on over to this camera. So when we're looking at tires, we're looking at the actual tire tread here. Uh, when we're looking at tire tread, these are starting to get worn down on the edges, both inner and outer. What a lot of people fail to do, I've had customers come in multiple times in the past and they'll say, and I'll say, hey, you're in need of tires very soon. So, man, my tires look great. What are you talking about? You know, they think that I'm uh, trying to be dishonest with them. And that is because most customers do not actually look at this inside edge. When the car is sitting on the ground, that inside edge is way in here. And you don't always see it. But that inside edge on this tire is supposed to have a groove in it just like that. And that groove back here is disappearing into nothing. Therefore, we actually have an issue with this tire uh, to where we are wearing on this very inside edge. 
Okay. Um, now, another thing that we can do though is there is a tire gauge or a tool that you can purchase um, where we can actually see the tread depth. So this is already telling me over here on this edge, this is already telling me that this tire needs to be replaced soon. Not urgent at this moment, but very soon. But when we're also looking at it, we're looking at the tread depth here. So I'm gonna go right down the middle of these treads. I'm gonna use this tool. I'm gonna grab the one that looks the deepest to me. And we're gonna look at this tool here. We're gonna spin it around. Now this is measuring in 30 seconds of an inch. I'm gonna double check it. Looks like I'm right at about 730 seconds. Drop back in here, check it, and yeah. We're sitting somewhere between six and 730 seconds, probably closer to six actually. Um, 630 seconds. According to our typical guides, 630 seconds means that we actually have quite a few, uh, we have mileage left on it. We typically say we need to replace somewhere around 330 seconds of an inch. Um, but again, looking at the sides of this tire, we're not set to do what's proper or, or we don't have that tread out on those edges. Now, why is it that we need to do that? Now, um, I'm gonna be a, a little bit of, um, hopefully not too much of a pain with these cameras, but I'm gonna go ahead and jump and grab one and we're gonna run to the back of the car. So give me one second here. And I'm gonna come in here. Now, the reason we went ahead and jumped back to the back of the car is if you look at our back tires here, here's a good tire or a tire with good tread, okay? So when we're looking at this tire with good tread, we have deep grooves on both inner and outer edges, and we have deep grooves here in the middle, sorry. Um, let me grab this tool real quick. Good. Okay, all right, so with this one, again, pull our, our depth here. Our depth on this one, we're actually looking more like 10, 30 seconds. So we've added, we've got quite a bit more meat and we can see that here. So another thing that I, uh, I'll probably take you back up front, we're gonna bar bounce back and forth a little bit, but down in these grooves, there's actually something called a wear bar and that wear bar is there so that you as a consumer can actually see when we're getting close to needing to replace them. But wanted to, you to see a tire that actually gave you, uh, I would almost venture to guess these are fairly new tires here on the rear. Um, looks like our other side is looking pretty good. So I'm gonna hop back to the front, which is good to switch, okay. All right, so as we get back, ooh, kicking. So as we get back into this, um, we have these, that's those tread wear bars that I was showing you. And those, when they are level with the tire, are telling us that there's something. Looks like I've got another question, so. Yes, they ask, can I use a coin to measure your tires? I know a lot of people do that, so yes. can so they use that? There is a coin trick. Um, completely honest, I never use the coin trick. I don't even know that, I know it's something like, you gotta use a penny, you hold it upside down, and if it comes up to Lincoln's nose or head, and I don't remember that. Sorry, uh, that's a Google answer on that one. You can use a penny though, um, and it is a good way of checking, and it is a cheaper, you know, cheaper way than buying a tool. Um, but again, I use, if we can switch cameras over here, I do like to use just this method. This method is really built into almost every tire. I've not actually seen a normal passenger car or light truck tire that does not have these wear bars in there. And I, I hope you can see what I'm talking about here, but this little bump right here when it is level. And so if you look at this outside one, um, again, we're gonna kind of pull this camera, but if you look at it from the edge, hopefully that's given you a decent enough view. But when you look at it from the edge, that is actually showing that we are getting fairly close there. And that's the, that's the one that I, I personally like to use. Now on this tire, again, we talked about it wearing down on this inside edge. Uh, we have a little bit of wear here on the outside edge as well. So that could have been from low inflation. So tire inflation, tire inflation being one of our big things that we need to keep on track. Now, since 2007, any vehicle sold here in the US actually has to have what they call a TPMS or tire pressure monitoring system. Tire pressure moder monitoring system actually has either a light indicator on the dash or it has uh, your actual readout of pressure um, on some type of display in the vehicle. With that, 
Uh, that was actually a federal mandate. And the biggest reason for that federal mandate was when we have our tire pressure correct, that actually gives us our best fuel mileage. Okay, so we're, we're really pushing for fuel mileage there. So you can have bad tire wear, but bad tire wear can also mean at times that we're actually lowering our fuel economy, whether due to the fact that we are too low or we are dragging the tires down the road as we go. There's a couple of different reasons that that can cause that. Okay, um, so alignment. Alignment is how do we have those tires set? Now, every vehicle kind of has their own spec from the manufacturer. Alignments are done by most of your auto shops or tire shops. Um, I do like to throw out there that I'm not a firm believer. There are a few companies out there that do lifetime alignments. You buy one time and they will do it for the rest of, your, of the life of your car. Um, only thing I don't like about that is they're typically not going for the best alignment they can. They're typically going for the fastest alignment they can. Um, but it's still not a bad option, just something to think about when we're doing that. Um, when we talk about alignments, one thing that I do like to kind of show is first thing we need to make sure is we don't want anything loose. Now I'm doing what I like to call, I've kind of called it my own shakedown. So when we talk about a shakedown, we're, we're going side to side and up and down. Uh, when we're doing that, going up and down, we are not, uh, this tire, I have no movement side to side or up and down. Um, and so therefore we have nothing that's loose, but it may need an alignment in the end. Due to the car just recently being purchased, it may have nothing to do with the alignment or that it could have been run low or there's a couple of other reasons that we can actually have that. Um, while we're here though, we're gonna go ahead and grab one of these cameras and talk a little bit about brakes. Again, couldn't pull the tires off of this, but I think we'll get in here. Um, so when we're talking about brakes, Skylar, could you do me a favor and grab that brake pad that's over there on the toolbox, please, sir? So when we're talking about brakes, these in here are what we call disc brakes. Um, disc brakes have just this, it's a rotor or a disc that's in there. It's gonna spin with the tire um, and when we apply our brakes, we press down on the brake pedal, we actually have two brake pads. Now I'll kind of actually jump over to this camera real quick. Um, we have brake pads in there um, that will ride on that disc. We've got one on the outside, one on the inside, and they squeeze when we press on that brake pedal, that fluid that we saw under the hood actually squeezes down on that rotor and due to friction, we build some heat, we actually slow our car down. Um, this is where I like to put a little shameless plug in with my students and say, this is, um, this is something that causes, or you're actually losing fuel economy there too. Well, we have to stop. So it is something that happens, but if we learn to not full throttle, full brake all the time, we can actually save on some of that fuel economy as well. So when we talk about brakes, when you are checking your brakes, you're checking that brake pad in there for, for the, what it looks like or how much pad is left. Um, Skylar, could you grab me the, the checker tool as well? So when we're looking at that brake pad, a couple of rules of thumb that we can deal with here. Um, be sure anytime you check the brake pad to check both outer pad. So that's the one, uh, if we can switch over to here, that's both this brake pad that's here and then another one that's back behind, if you can see where my index finger is back here, but also on the back side of that rotor. Now, when we talk about um, checking both of them, hence why we would have wanted to have the tires off on this, but we can use a tool. So they make a tool again, I'm showing you things that can be purchased, uh, but I'm gonna show you some tips and tricks that we can use without purchasing tools as well. So with this, if I take this tool and slide it here against this backing plate and see what matches, something I wanna point out, this is a brand new brake pad, at least for the best I can tell. Um, but this is a brand new brake pad and this tool just shows you, okay, best, and we start going down, we're color coded. The thickness of this brake pad is actually the second one down already. So not all brake pads come at the max of what this tool shows, okay? So that's using a tool. Well. Again, like our viewer earlier asked using a coin, we're not gonna go out and buy a tool just to check our own brakes. Rule of thumb that I learned from a good friend of mine years ago is this is a backing plate when we're looking at this brake pad. This backing plate, 
There's a thickness there. Let's just call it about a quarter of an inch. That's pretty close, probably about a quarter of an inch. When our brake pad, <laughs> when our brake pad gets down to the thickness of that backing plate. When our, our thickness is about the thickness of that backing plate, our brake pad, we're getting close to needing to replace. We may not need to replace right now, but we're getting closer to that point. That's when we start throwing it in on budgeting. I'm very much a person that, you know, I wish every auto shop could have somebody that had, hey, here, let's budget forward. And again, just beating up that whole fact of if you can establish that relationship, you can always make sure that you have somebody that is like, hey, you're looking at budgeting this in the next six months. So brake pads, always be sure, check inside and outside pad because they do wear at different times and we've had issues with that. All right, um, so backing up from there, we got tires, we got wheels, um, we got suspension, um, and then we also have our alignment. So all of that kind of happens under here. Um, I know I'm gonna be running out of time very soon, so kind of wanna just make sure there's no other questions out there, first of all. Uh, second of all, I kind of wanted to just touch on going back to purchasing a car and things to look for. Um, again, I always say we really need to make sure that you're either having it checked out or be able to bring somebody with you that can do some, some minor checks for you. S service records, ask if they have any service records for it. And it's not a bad idea. If you are, say, spending, let's just say your budget is somewhere around $10,000 for a car. If you're spending $10,000, it's not a bad idea um, to go out and purchase something like Carfax. I'm not saying Carfax is the only one out there or the best one to use, but use some type of source to where you are getting a list of things that could have happened to the car. For example, accidents. A lot of, there's more shops getting on board with actually reporting to Carfax about maintenance that's happening on the vehicle uh, and so on and so forth, okay? so. Just make sure that, uh, you know, if you're spending that much money, make sure you are spending it or checking it. Um, what are we doing on time, guys? I just want to make sure we're not running it too bad. All right, down to five. So last thing we're going to do, um, Skylar, if you would, go ahead and go up with the car for me. I'm going to go ahead and pull this guy. Is that cool? All right. Um, so just... Because we're doing this, oh, we got a question. All right, let's answer some questions and then we'll get back into where I was. Okay, what are the difference in gas grades? Gas grades, oh, I love this question because I'm not highly educated in it. Um, no, so you've got regular plus and then premium. Uh, every gas station seems to, to do them, name them a little different. Your major change in your gas grades, or at least the way I'm gonna put it, is how quickly it burns or how fast it burns. Um, so the higher the gas grade, the less volatile or the less it explodes and the slower it burns. What that does is that gives us a more controlled fire within the engine. So uh, if you're not familiar with it, an engine, gasoline-based, runs on a entire explosion uh, principle, okay? We need gas in there, we ignite it, we explode it. With having that, we are needing to um, control that burn though, because if we explode too quickly, we get a smack or a push on the piston it's not wanting. Um, so our gra gas, gates help, gas grades help us by what the car needs. What I'll tell you is from most of my research and uh, knowledge, typically we want to just stay with whatever the car calls for. If it doesn't call for a premium, it's not necessarily to run premium. Um, so just do as needed when you are dealing with that. If you do, if your car calls for a premium though, at any point, try to always have premium in there. If you only have regular and you're again stuck in the middle of somewhere, you can use it, be very gentle on the throttle, uh, and go from there. Hopefully that answers your question on that one. Um, any other questions right now? We're gonna do one last run through, you good? All right, we'll do one last run through. And I, I really just wanna hit this um, with our uh, audience, especially wanting to, to hit the community members around here. And that is, 
something that I see happen a lot in the South, and we're going back to, to buying cars. Um, typically what happens in the South, Linsky, do we have a, a good view of somewhere right around where my hand is on number three? Okay. So I'm gonna use this area here and then we're actually gonna, I'll, I'll walk you back through, hopefully we'll get you good enough. But what happens a lot on your uh, cars is up north we use a lot of rust, or sorry, a lot of salt on the road, which causes rust. A lot of times what happens is as we, as we use salt causing rust, um, we actually start getting some rust pits in the vehicle and they can actually be detrimental. Um, not to use a derogatory term, but in the car industry, we call that cancer. It is a type of cancer on your car. Once it starts, it is very difficult to stop, okay? Uh, near impossible. So when we deal with rust, um, what we find though is a lot of used car dealerships will buy cars from up north where rust is common. So if you're watching from, you know, what we call the salt belt, Michigan and up north that way, um, you guys are used to that. That is a common thing you guys deal with. But when we talk about around here, it's very common for them to bring it down and sell it to Southerners because they're not quite looking for that. Hence why I suggest you take it to your mechanic, the one you trust, to make sure that they're looking it over before you purchase it. I think we're about out of time. Just something that I wanna throw out there. Uh, if you know someone or you are interested in an automotive program, we have both a two and a four year degree here at Southern. Um, so feel free to reach out and contact me. You can put your, um, put your name uh, or your contact info or ask for info uh, on any of the uh, websites that we're streaming on and we can get you as much info as possible or get you in touch with myself. Uh, but if you're looking for that as a career, uh, or if you're just looking for a shop, um, we can try to help you at least in the area. So thank you uh, for your time. I hope this was very beneficial. And um, yeah, hope you have a good evening.